Okay, let me introduce myself because I'm going to do the next speak as a talk. And what I'm going to do very quickly is to show you why we use contrast enhanced ultrasound in liver transplantation. Um, we, we are uh, the biggest liver transplant hospital in, in Europe. And uh, it's not something that you should ignore liver transplantation because you're going to see one of these patients. There are in between the years 1968, 2008, there were nearly 85,000 patients with a liver transplant. So wherever your practice is, even if it's not in a transplant center, you're going to actually come across these patients. The EFSM guidelines contain recommendations. There are only a short uh, set of recommendations, so, but where you can use it. But if you look at uh, where, where you're using it, you're really using it in areas where you can confirm that vascularity is, is, is um, present or absent. And you're also looking at fluid collections, active breeding, bleeding, infarction, and monitoring thrombolysis if you use it. So they're very limited areas to use it, but it makes it quite a difference to, to your patient if you're using this, because you can use contrast-enhanced ultrasound at the bedside instead of transferring the patient to further imaging. Those of you who are not familiar with the surgical techniques of liver transplantation, these are quite important because this is a traditional uh, surgical um, technique where you just cut something out, take the liver out, and replug it in exactly the same manner. The problem with this is you'd have to clamp the <coughs> IVC during the whole operation, which would take four or five hours, and this would increase patient morbidity because of the peripheral edema that would, would um, um, present itself. More now in adult transplantation, you'll get piggyback transplantation, where you've actually preserved the IVC and you anastomose the, the uh, whole of the transplant liver at one point uh, to the IVC, usually in the hepatic veins. So that's what you'll be dealing with. Important to know that. But of course, your surgeons won't tell you what sort of operation the patients had on the request form. You have to figure it out looking for, for the various uh, options. You can do a split liver transplant, two, two recipients from the donor liver, and this becomes a little bit more pro problematic because of the bleeding and oozing of bile from the cut liver surface. Segmental reduction, this is something that you cut the liver down to, to fit the patient. This is for pediatric patients. Auxiliary transplant, where you put a transplant on a diseased liver that you're expecting to recover. And now, of course, there's living-related transplantation, uh, usually the right lobe, but quite often you're doing the left lobe as well. Where will the complications arise? Well, if you divide it into vascular, or non-vascular, it's only going to be the hepatic artery, hepatic veins, and IVC or portal vein. Non-vascular complications, graft rejection is largely out of your hands, but biliary tract complications can be quite profound and may require retransplantation, localized infections, and miscellaneous. Vascular complications with the hepatic artery, thrombosis, stenosis, or pseudoaneurysm. The portal vein, because it's bigger, it's stenosis or thrombosis. Rarely do you get a pseudoaneurysm and hepatic veins and IVCs against stenosis. The hepatic artery after transplantation is crucial to the viability of the transplant because it's the sole supply to the biliary system. And if you lose the hepatic artery in an adult patient, you will eventually lose that hepatic graft from biliary sepsis, etc. In the child, this may not be uh, true because of usually a hepatico jejunostomy is formed and there is a lot of... Um, extra vascularity in that area, which you may get away from uh, losing the transplant. And if you don't see a hepatic artery on, tra uh, on ultrasound, usually you're, you're going to do a multi-detector CT or an angiography, That's it. but adding contrast may actually help you. These figures are from old studies because there are very few new studies done on, on transplantation, but the hepatic artery thrombosis was estimated up to 12% in adults and in the smaller uh, um, arteries in children up to 42%. I would say these figures are much lower now with improved techniques and, and uh, detection of imaging as well. You will see that more often. And of course, if you delay the diagnosis, liver transplantation, it, it will occur. Color Doppler ultrasound is, is really very good at picking up uh, the, the hepatic artery. Before the advent of color Doppler ultrasound, of course, uh, uh, you, you had no idea what was going on with the patient unless you biopsied the patient because the presentation of hepatic artery thrombus is, is so nonspecific, it could be exactly the same as rejection. But color Doppler ultrasound should see in normally 96% of the hepatic arteries. So our practice here is you do, on the liver failure unit, a, a, a Doppler ultrasound at 24 hours, then on day four, very often by day four, they, they can come down to the department and then just prior to discharge. 
And if there's a normal recovery, there should be no problems there at all. You may get a high resistance hepatic artery in severe hepatic edema, hypotension, or high-grade hepatic stenosis. And this is what the uh, hepatic artery would look like in that liver. This not, it is not necessarily a harbinger of doom, uh, but however it's persistently high with the patient uh, uh, quite ill, you may want to think about further management, particularly biopsy. And you're looking for the change of the high resistance to the lower resistance over a period of time. So this is a patient from day one to day five, and it's improved considerably uh, over that time. So, but you want to pick up hepatic artery thrombosis early so you can manage it with thrombolysis or revascularization quickly to save that liver. The study we did looking at contrast in hand ultrasound quite some time ago now was actually looking at just color Doppler flow, not the low mechanical index imaging. And we could see the hepatic artery in 95.6% of those patients anyway uh, before contrast, but this improved it to 98%. Um, it, it doesn't sound like very much, but it does make a big difference to the patient and management of the uh, uh, patients if you can almost get 100% sensitivity and specificity for this. And the only on one patient on angiography that we thought the uh, uh, hepatic artery was occluded, it wasn't occluded, it was just very, very high resistance. And these were the images we got, and we were using in, in those days Levovis rather than, uh, than Sonovu uh, to give you Doppler rescue, injecting the contrast and not seeing that artery at all confirmed on, on angiography. Now we use low mechanical index imaging and you can pick up that hepatic artery quite clearly. You follow the line of that hepatic artery and the imaging is much better. But you've got the arterial phase at the very beginning to see that hepatic artery on its own before you get the portal venous flow coming in and getting both uh, um, enhancement together. You can use flash imaging to burst all the bubbles and try and watch the hepatic artery separate from the portal vein coming in, but it can be difficult. So you've got a very small window of opportunity to, to witness this. And if I show you just an example of a patient that's done as a portable examination on the ITU, you can't really see on color Doppler whether or not there's a, a, a hepatic artery patent. It should be along that, that area. But look at this. Inject your contrast. There's the uh, aorta, celiac axis, splenic artery, and you're absolutely sure that there's no hepatic artery there. Management now is along a different pathway. This patient can be revascularized immediately after the ultrasound examination. The introduction of CT is, has changed, the, the uh, multi-detector CT has changed the, the management of hepatic artery thrombus because you can do this now very quickly and easily, but you need to transfer the patient down to, to the angio suite as opposed to what we did in the past, angiography. You can pick up collateralization around uh, an included hepatic artery, but this is the, the waveform that's quite a, a clue to whether or not you've got another complication of um, a transplant artery. How can you use it in a practical manner? Well, if you're doing a portable examination on the intensive care unit and you see a liver like this, uh, you inject contrast and you can immediately tell them that no, there is no hepatic artery, you can't see it, there's a collection, but more importantly, there is either collections, abscesses, or necrosis of that liver. Hepatic artery stenosis is the next most complication, uh, common complication of the transplant artery. And you, the ideal uh, scenario is to pick up that focus of, of high velocity in, in the hepatic artery, but often it's obscured by a number of factors in the post-operative patient, not least the number of surgical dressings that may be present. What you look at for is the TARDIS parvis waveform, which I showed you a little bit earlier, which you're all very familiar with, looking for that acceleration time, the resistance index, and the, uh, the RI, as it's called. And if you've got a prolonged acceleration time, and a, a, a low RI, you're likely to have hepatic artery stenosis, but a similar pattern can be seen in a number of other diseases uh, associated with that. This is a classic TARDIS parvis waveform from the hepatic artery of, of this patient. We looked at seeing whether or not we could use microbubble contrast to look at hepatic artery stenosis, a large number of patients over a couple of years. And what we found was that even using contrast-enhanced ultrasound, Yes, you could pick up the areas of, of stenosis, directly measure that area of stenosis. And again, this is in the days of color Doppler. But it was just as good to, to and here's one uh, that you see with the low mechanical index imaging. It was just as good to just pick out the TARDIS parvis to diagnose a hepatic artery stenosis. So the adding contrast didn't really help you there. 
but it made uh, uh, you, you more confident it's actually detecting the, the focus of, of um, the stenosis. The other complication that can occur is hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm. It can be within the liver or outside the liver. And outside the liver is associated with a much um, higher frequency of, of uh, uh, death uh, because it's usually associated with sepsis and fungal sepsis. Again, we looked at our patients uh, over a number of years, over 1,000 liver transplants. The incidence is only about 1%, percent. <coughs> 9 at the site of the anastomosis, 4 intrahepatic, 70% mortality with it. And the management is coil embolization, but most of these patients will eventually require retransplantation. And this is where contrast-enhanced ultrasound can be more useful than, than in uh, hepatic artery stenosis. Just as some examples of, of uh, pseudoaneurysms mm -hmm. within the liver after a biopsy. And it can be very slow flow in there. The hepatic angiogram took a long time to fill that um, one up. This is just a couple of cases with low mechanical index imaging. This is a patient with CCI, came in with hepatic artery with a small pseudoaneurysm. This was then embolized. These are the embolization coils, but there's still swirling of contrast in that pseudoaneurysm. The patient goes back uh, uh, based on that, the further embolization, rechecked with contrast-enhanced ultrasound the next day, and you can see it's gone from something like that to that to show you it's really embolized. Portal vein, uh, there are a lot of risk factors to portal vein complications, uh, and most of them are to do with the pre-morbid existence of uh, portal hypertension. Um, the portal vein is much bigger than uh, the hepatic artery and less of a surgical challenge. So less often do you get portal vein stenosis. But again, rather than just relying on velocity measurements, losing low mechanical index, you can delineate the, the degree of stenosis of the portal vein. However, the portal vein is very flexible. The stenosis need not always be uh, treated and can be watched over a period of time looking for complications of portal hypertension. What you're looking on color Doppler ultrasound is to look at the step up in velocity across that stenosis. But in this patient with this such severe uh, stenosis, this actually resolved over a period of one year. IVC stenosis is rare, but again, because it's a big vessel. Hepatic vein stenosis, more common. Thrombosis is very rare, but will occur with Bud Chiari. And this is an image lent to me by uh, Professor Piscali, uh, showing you stenosis in the, the, that piggyback anastomosis of the hepatic veins to the IVC and the narrowing there. So you can make the diagnosis with more confidence using contrast-enhanced ultrasound, probably not needing to, to go on to any other imaging. The non-vascular uh, complications, the liver transplantation, graft rejection, biliary tract localized infection. Graft rejection, you get these multiple areas of focal stenosis through the hepatic artery. Um, which were, are not amenable to balloon angioplasty and quite often just requires treatment uh, and possible um, retransplantation if it gets too severe. You can pick up any evidence of biliary obstruction quite easily and biliary sepsis with little abscesses forming around the biliary tree, which are not quite so evident on the, on the B-mode ultrasound examination. You can also pick up areas of focal um, infarction and focal biliary dilatation. This is a dilatation of the biliary tree in one segment of the liver, uh, secondary to a, a segmental infarction of the hepatic artery. It delineates this more clearly than you do on the B-mode ultrasound to allow you to, to make the diagnosis. Other complications where you may use contrast-enhanced ultrasound include abscesses and PTLD, post-transplant lymphatic disorder, this is a patient only just come through the department a couple of weeks ago. There is no hepatic artery, it's thrombosed, and he's developed biliary abscesses. And the contrast-enhanced ultrasound shows this clearly. And there is some echogenic debris in there that's not vascularized, it's echogenic <coughs> debris. PTLD occurs more often in children and is associated with the Epstein-Barr virus. And you'll find that these occur in many different organs, the kidney, the liver, the bowel, the lymph nodes. And it's quite nice to make the diagnosis. And it behaves exactly like um, lymphoma elsewhere. And this is old imaging. And this is in the spleen. This is uh, where we're using high mechanical index imaging to burst those bubbles. But you get that characteristic feathery pattern that we've seen uh, a little bit earlier on today in, in, in some of the presentations. And this is a renal uh, lymphoma in a patient. And again, look at that appearance of that feathery 
pattern through that lesion, uh, almost characteristic of lymphoma uh, seen elsewhere. You can use it to, in areas where you want to delineate not just the uh, abscesses, but the fluid surrounding organs and, and pleural space to get a more confident uh, visualization of what you're doing. And this is the cut surface of that liver with a little bit of viable tissue there. And this is a bioloma on the surface. You can see exactly what you're dealing with. And if you need to drain it, of course, uh, you can use it under contrast enhanced ultrasound. So there are limited areas of uh, use of contrast in liver transplantation. It's more a practical tool. It's not a diagnostic tool, but it's certainly useful in thrombosis and areas of infarction and picking up complications within the abdomen and, and chest. Thank you.